Just try. Recording in progress. Okay, right. here we go. All right. Okay, welcome. Today I have the honor of speaking with filmmaker, documentarian, author, stage director, and a man with experience in pretty much any form of media you can imagine, Tony Palmer. Tony first came to my attention when, by pure chance, I came upon his documentary series, All You Need Is Love, the story of popular music. This was of great interest to me because I have been rehearsing the interplay or researching the interplay of politics and cultural change with popular music. This seems to be a thread through Tony's work and is hopefully something we can explore as we make our way along the path of Tony's experience, which includes relationships with many well-known personalities and groups, including the Beatles, Cream, Leonard Cohen, and many others. So thank you for talking with me today, Tony. Um, would you like to start out and just talk about your, uh, your childhood and, and how you got into working in, in the media? Uh, well, I don't think the childhood is particularly interesting. I mean, I was, brought up, I was born in London, but I was brought up by my godparents. My godfather uh, was a very, um, in his day, very famous uh, uh, engineer, and with his partner, a man called Nigel Gresley, they built two of the fastest steam trains ever built. One huh. was, the model was called A3, that's known as the Flying Scotsman now, and the other one is the A4, which is known as the Mallard. And if I can turn this around, I don't know whether you can see in the distance, probably not, unless I turn the light on, but there's a desk over there, and I think we just turn a bit more light. Yeah, now, now you can see it. The desk behind the, the chair. Uh -huh. On that desk was the, those two trains were actually designed. And in the middle drawer, uh, when I inherited it from my godfather, uh, there was the original sketch, the original drawings for um, uh, doing the, now I have to turn the lights back on again because this light is very bad. <laughs> Uh, were the original sketches for the Mallard, which is this famous train with the swoop front. Anyway, um, he, uh, during the war, he went to work at a place called Goonhilly Downs, which was in Cornwall, because he was seconded to work on the development of radar. So I look upon Cornwall as my real home. That's where I feel at home, and that's where I have a, my home, my house is there. But we also have a house and an office in London. And uh, then uh, eventually I went to uh, Cambridge University uh, to study a subject called moral sciences, which has nothing to do with morality and certainly absolutely nothing to do with science. But its two most famous uh, alumni were the original great professor, Bertrand Russell, and then his pupil, <laughs> seems odd to describe as a pupil, but his pupil Wittgenstein. So if you imagine Bertrand Russell Wittgenstein, I'm in that sort of genre, although wow. not, not the same by any stretch of the imagination. And while I was at Cambridge, um, I had a friend who was, uh, I think about four years ahead of me, but he was at Oxford. And he eventually became a very distinguished uh, theatre director called Patrick Garland. And he'd gone to work at the BBC and I just thought I was going to be a kind of rather mediocre, second-rate academic and continue in the academic world. And he said, would I like to come and work for him um, as a humper of equipment? Because in those days, equipment was ginormous. Um, not like the wonderful digital technology of today. We're talking about 1964, 1963, actually, 1963. And... Um, he, he'd been asked by the BBC to make a film about the Salzburg Festival. Um, that's, the irony of that is that in 2006, I made an enormous film about the Salzburg Festival, which caused a terrible row and still causes a row um, because of various attitudes which it took. 
Anyway, um, and would I like to come? He said, I know you know Salzburg, which is true, I did. I know you speak some German, which is true, I did. Now come and help me hunt the equipment. So we've been there. The, the topography of Salzburg, as you know, is a castle on the top, and the town goes around underneath it with the river, yeah. uh, the Salzach. And um, the, I hadn't been there more than a couple of days. And he said, tomorrow morning, we're going to be filming up there in the castle. Can you get the equipment up there by eight o'clock in the morning? That was my job. So I did it. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was absolutely knackered. Um, anyway, I'm slumped in the corner of a room, not, not much bigger than the room that I'm now sitting in. And um, waiting for things to happen. And a door flung open. <laughs> And in came this guy who came straight over me, pointed straight at me and said, who are you? So I said, luckily I recognised him, I stumbled up. Um, and it was the great, um, I'm never quite sure whether he would want to be described as a surrealist, but the great painter Oscar Prokoshka, um, uh, the um, lover of, of, of um, Alma Mahler, among other things, connection there to the ah, yeah. music world. Uh, and because um, Patrick Garland, who'd got me up there, um, didn't really tell me what we were supposed to be doing. Just get the equipment there. So now it's Oscar Kokoschka, then the film crew arrived, then the students arrived. They started setting up the uh, easels. There was obviously going to be some sort of uh, art class. And if over there, three metres away or two metres away, was Oscar Kokoschka in the other direction was what these students, half a dozen students, were actually drawing, which was without question the most wonderfully beautiful naked girl I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I remember sitting in my corner thinking, Oscar Kokoschka, beautiful girl, and I'm being paid for this. This is my future. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with academia anymore. <laughs> this is the future. So Two years later, I joined the BBC. So when you were, uh, when you were at school, when you were learning from Bertrand Russell, did you have involvement with the CND at all? Yeah, uh, with Bertrand, yes, yes. I went on a march with Bertrand Russell. Really? I sat alongside him as we were both uh, um, jetted with water. It's all quite entertaining. <laughs> and he, he kept saying to me, have you done this before? <laughs> I said, not with such distinguished company. <laughs> we were sitting on the we were sitting on the steps of the foreign office. I remember it as clearly as if it was yesterday afternoon. Hmm. So um, I'm I'm pretty I mean, interested. I was, I was able to talk with that in a very limited way about Principia Mathematica, which was his great one of his great books. Hmm. Seems odd, doesn't it? You go on a C and D march and you sit on the steps of H M Treasury and you're talking about Principia Mathematica, and actually you're there. Uh, uh, to ban the bomb. Yeah, yeah. Did you know Jeff Nuttall at all? Um, only in passing. I mean, I didn't. Yeah. He was never a close friend. Yeah. Um, yeah, I knew who he was, obviously. So you're working for the BBC, pretty so now much. Now I from, joined the BBC. Yes. From the mid '60s. Um, from, uh, 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 end of '65. End of '65. And. And I almost immediately was a given as a, as a kind of, again, a humper of the equipment, although eventually we became extremely good friends. And in fact, I became his producer, um, uh, Ken Russell, and we made a film called Isadora. About oh, Isadora the, Duncan. Not the Vanessa Redgrave film. She ripped everything or uh, the Carol Rice stole all our ideas from it. We were, we were both <laughs> right across. And then having made somewhat of a success of that, um, uh, I was summoned by the boss, who was a, a man called Hugh Weldon, uh, who said, I've got bad news. And I thought I was going to be fired. And he, I said, what's that? He said, Jonathan Miller wants to make a film. I said, well, surely that's good news. And, and, and Hugh Weldon said, well, not really, because we don't want him to make a film. Why don't you want him to make a film? Well, he's no idea how to make a film. And I said, oh, fine. What, what do you want me to do? Well, he said, you know, you produce now Ken Russell's film. You can go and produce Jonathan's film to make sure he stays on the straight and narrow. So I then produced uh, Jonathan, Jonathan's film of Alice in Wonderland. Ah, yeah. Hmm. And then the, my next job as humper of the equipment 
uh, was the BBC had tried for years, uh, I mean, about seven years, uh, I think, uh, to persuade Benjamin Britten to allow them to make a film about it. Now, there had been a film in 1959, a 10-minute black and white film made by a wonderful director, John Schlesinger, which for reasons that we didn't know, although I found out eventually, Britain absolutely hated. Um, I, what I found out much later on was that uh, this was according to Peter Pierce, Britain's lover and, and uh, collaborator, as it were, that uh, Peter thought that Ben had either made a pass at Schlesinger or the other way around, and it hadn't worked. <laughs> Therefore, you couldn't ever mention the name of John Schlesinger to, <laughs> to Benjamin Britten. Um, and that wasn't the only reason. I mean, he was notoriously a uh, private man. I mean, he would allow the BBC to film him in the, in the studio, playing the piano with uh, singing, or uh, conducting, he didn't mind that, but he didn't want a kind of intimate portrait of himself. He thought that was bad. And it was partly, of course, because at that time, um, living in an openly gay relationship was illegal. Yeah, now, everybody yeah. knew that he was living in an openly gay relationship, but he didn't want that broadcast, as it were. Anyway, we come now to 1967, and there was the opening of the big new concert hall in of uh, Snake, Concert Hall, um, uh, which was a, a converted um, barn almost, uh, where they used to dry the hops for, for making beer. And Britain had always seen this down the valley, this building, and had wanted it. And anyway, yeah. and the BBC tried desperately to persuade him that this is the excuse, you know. Eventually, we, we now know it was the Queen Mum who told him. Really? Uh, I, 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 our recent Queen's mother, the Queen Mother, right. who said, you know, this is going to be a state occasion. I'm coming. Uh, Her Majesty, her daughter, is coming. The Duke of Edinburgh is coming. There were people, lots of people filming it, you know. Damn well, that's and the opening of this magnificent concert hall. I mean, it's one of the great concert halls of the world. And surely that's the occasion where you should allow a film to be made. So he eventually agreed. And I was going to be the, the tea boy, as it were. Uh, while um, uh, the film was going to be produced by the then head of music, a man called Humphrey Burton. And the th we were due to start on a, on a Monday. I, uh, I don't remember the exact date, but it's, it was the um, beginning of June. The previous uh, Wednesday, Humphrey Burton got fired and he, from the BBC, and he got fired because it had been leaked to the London Evening Standard that Humphrey and a man called Frank Muir and a couple of other people they were going off to set up the first independent uh, uh, commercial television company in London to be called London Weekend Television. Right. The bosses of the BBC looked upon this as utter betrayal. How <laughs> can you do this? And the same man, Hugh Weldon, um, was um, the person who was deeply, deeply offended because he'd been training Humphrey, really, to take over as head of BBC Television. Anyway, uh, so Humphrey rings me. I'm in Albury. And he says, I don't know what we're going to do, but you know, don't just stay there. This was followed fairly rapidly by Hugh Weldon, who was a very distinguished military man, apart from being uh, the effective head of the BBC at that point, BBC Television. And because he was a military man, when, he, when I, I went to answer his phone call, which was down in the reception, because it was a very sort of primitive sort of hotel we were all staying in, uh, Hugh Weldon's first lines to me were, Palmer! The cavalry are coming, <laughs> by which he meant himself, of course. <laughs> anyway, I said, thank you. So I went back up to my room and thinking, oh, it's the end of the world. My career is gone before it started. Then about half an hour later, knock, knock, knock on the door. And I said, I said to the manager of the hotel, I don't care who it is this time. I'm not answering any more calls. And he said, I think you'll want to answer this one. And I said, why? Who is it? It's Benjamin Britten. Now, I'd met Britain by this time and got to know him a reasonable amount. Anyway, I go. And, and then when I, when I spoke to Ben on the phone, he said, don't worry. He said, we've heard, we know. I think you'd better come up here to the Red House, there where they live, and have tea. So I went up and, um, and uh, we had tea. And what, what they kept saying was, you know, don't worry about it, but you know, we'll get you through it. And there were endless stories about how, in fact, they got me through it. I'd never made a film on my own at really? all. Ever. Wow. 
But the two things I remembered very clearly were, one, um, uh, Peter had produced the most enormous fruit cake, which he was cutting like this for fury. And then Ben was making them pouring the tea. I mean, you know, I'm being poured tea by the greatest composer of our time. <laughs> That's very bizarre. But the other thing was that they kept, the two of them kept giggling. Well, they were a bit like that. I mean, they were sort of prep school masters who giggled a lot, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So um, uh, years later, when I made yet another film, I made five films altogether, with or about Ben. When I made a later film, Ben had now died. And I said to Peter, do you remember this tea? And he said, yes, yes, we rem I remember it very well. I said, can you tell me, you know, why were the two of you giggling? Was it something I said, something I was wearing or what? He said, no, 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 you misunderstood. He said, we never wanted to make that film. You know that. We never wanted that. Humphrey Burton's got fired and we're stuck with you. And we knew that you had no idea what you were doing. <laughs> so we thought we're on home dry here. <laughs> Luckily, the film worked out all right, um, except it wasn't. It wasn't, um, it didn't work out all right, actually. I mean, I filmed, for example, I filmed, the film is, has a really scintillating title, not chosen by me, it's called Benjamin Britten and his best good right. title. No, but it is the opening of Snape and there's the Queen and so on and so on. The famous duet between Britain and Richter, uh, which is one of the things that they, en uh, Britain engineered, because Richter refused to be filmed. I mean, he hated being filmed. Really? Um, and Ben said to me, I told this to Britain, and he said, well, you know, just be on the stage in Snape at three o'clock precisely, or ready by three o'clock, and I will bring him in. And he won't be able to refuse because I'm there, you see. So I'm on the stage with the cameras and lights, very little light, actually, as little as I can get away with. Door opens of Snape in, in, in March Richter first, and he saw me on the stage, and there was... If, if looks could kill, I would be. I would have been dead instantly. I mean, he, there would have been a beam coming straight at me. Anyway, he was. He turned to go, and as he turned to go, Britain, who was right behind him, grabbed him by the arm and frog marched him onto the stage. So when you see that famous piece of what became a famous piece of film of the duet, what you have to understand is that Richter decided that he was going to get his revenge on Britain for this. So he was constantly speeding up or slowing down just to see what Britain would do. Now, of course, Britain himself was a phenomenal pianist. I mean, it would have been a very great pianist had he not also been a very great conductor. And, you know, the interchange of two of the two of because Britain is giving as good as he's getting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, another thing that we, we filmed, which is why I hesitated when I said I think it worked out quite well, was I filmed one uh, song with the Vienna Boys Choir from uh, um, Ceremony of Carols, Deo Gratias, um, the carol. And it ends with the harp going and then the choir going chord, chord, chord. Mm -hmm. yep. And I realized when I got back to the editing room uh, that uh, I hadn't filmed enough. Uh, <laughs> I'd made a mess of it, in other words. So, oh, that's all right. I'll just cut four bars out. So now we have the official screening with and um, Britain and Piers came and with the said Hugh Weldon as well. So I'm I've got Britain on my left and Piers on my right, Hugh Weldon right behind me, to whom I'd never mentioned it. And it's on celluloid, of course, because of the digital technology didn't exist. And the film is going through the projector, and I suddenly remembered these four bars that I'd cut out. So I thought, what do I do at this point? If I turn to Britain and cough loudly or say, you know, are you enjoying this, Mr. Not something just to distract his attention. And I was in such a panic that the, this cut went through before I could do anything. Yeah. Lunch afterwards, uh, the, both Britain and Piers were very nice, very complimentary. Uh, and end of, end of the lunch, they go downstairs to get in the limo. Uh, Piers gives a big kiss. Britain finally gave me a, a big kiss and said, come and see us anytime you... Albro, we'd love to see you again, etc., etc., etc. He gets into the limo, one foot inside the car, and he just turns around, turns back to me, and said, "You know, actually, I think it's better without those four bars." <laughs> in a strange way, that tells you everything about Britain. You know, yeah. what little human being, apart from the else, spite of all the problems uh, associated with him, but a musician yeah. of such sharp ears that 
you know, you, there was nothing you were going to get away with. <laughs> yeah. So okay. anyway, unfortunately, the, the Britain film, that first Britain film, was then networked in the BBC uh, uh, in the United States. It was the first oh, yeah. BBC film on the Bell Telephone Hour. It was the first BBC film ever to be networked wow. in the United States. And yeah. it won a lot of surprises. So, and unfortunately, my career was finished before it started in a strange way. Anyway, you <laughs> asked how did I get going? That's the answer. Okay, yeah. So um, tell me when you first met John Lennon and, and uh, started getting involved in uh, popular music and rock and roll. When did that happen? Yeah. Well, I mean, I was still at Cambridge and um, we finally worked out the date. Uh, we, uh, it was in October, again, October 63. It was my lucky year in a way. And um, the, this relatively unknown group called the Beatles came to give a concert at the, Re the old Regal Cinema. And I'd been sent along uh, to represent the university newspaper, which was called Varsity, and write about their them and at their press conference. So I went to the press conference, which was around about lunchtime. And um, after the press conference, it was one of those, you've seen a film of similar silly Beatles press conferences, you know, right. where they're all, you know, trying to be nice to the journalists who are asking <laughs> daft, stupid questions as journalists do. Anyway, um, we were all standing around uh, afterwards and uh, this chap came up to me and, banged me on the shoulder and said, why didn't I ask any questions? And I said, well, I thought the whole thing was pretty silly. And he said, uh, he agreed, what did I, oh, we're running out of time. Meeting will end in 10 minutes. Upgrade now. Upgrade now. Yeah, you, we, uh, I guess we have to have some kind of special. Uh... No, I've upgraded it now. So it'll go on for a bit longer. And then, then all you do is when it stops, I yeah. dial you again and start again. Really? No, it's it's Giddy's play. Okay, good. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it, it tapped me on the shoulder and said, well, no, said, what do you do? I'm a student. What of? Well, I've already told you about moral sciences. And he thought that was pretty silly. And then he said, would I show him around Cambridge? And I said, no, why not? Well, because, you know, you'll, you'll be mobbed. I mean, they were, they'd, I think they'd had two number ones by now, but they weren't anything like as intergalactically famous as they became. Right. Anyway, um, so eventually he said, well, how about if I come and disguise? So I said, all right. <laughs> I was having, having my bluff called. Um, so we, arra I, we arranged, I would go to his hotel, um, uh, which at uh, two o'clock, and I did. And there was this apparition, this man in this gigantic fedora hat. Uh, with a silly beard, I don't know where he'd found, <laughs> and without question, the dirtiest brown Macintosh you've ever seen in your life. So we both got the giggles, basically. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I managed to get him into King's College, the famous King's College Chapel, mm -hmm. um, which you see all the time. And also I got him into Trinity College uh, Library, which is a famous library called the Wren Library. And I mean... Uh, he was just pulling books off shelves left, right, and centre. And I thought, oh, Christ, I mean, my university career is going straight down the tubes here. Uh, but I mean, he was he was really attentive to these books. And of course, I realised retrospectively that what he was sending a signal uh, about was that he deeply regretted not having had a formal secondary, maybe university education. Yeah. And he felt he'd missed that completely. So anyway, at the end of at the end, I had I delivered him back to his hotel, and he scribbled a telephone number on a piece of paper and said, "Call me when you come to London." So I said, "Well, I'm not coming to London. I, I hope still hope vaguely to be in academics. I'm going to be here at least another two or three years." And he said, "Okay, well, you're well. You've never call me." So two or three years later, I did join the BBC, as we uh, said. And I still had this bit of paper, but by now, of course, this is uh, the Beatles were intergalactic. I mean, it, right. it, it, coincidental with Sergeant Pepper. And um, so the um, uh, I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just no, nothing, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'll dial the number, not thinking it wouldn't connect at all, but it did, and it rang. And then somebody answered the phone very quickly, and it was a woman, and you could tell from her voice that. 
I was the 400th person that morning who'd rung <laughs> up to say John Lennon said to call. Yeah. Well, he did, and this is my number, and I'm at the BBC. I never expected to hear back. Uh, half an hour later, a man called Derek Taylor, who's the Beatles' famous uh, publicist, right. rang and said, I've got a message for you from John. And I mean, I began to shake. I thought, God, uh, uh, what will the message be? <laughs> I was really worried about it. So eventually I said, and what is the message from John? And Derek said, John wants to know why it's taken you three years to call him <laughs> And he wants to see you. Come and have lunch. Uh, so lunch with John, of course, is brown rice. Uh, the main course, brown rice for dessert. And <laughs> every <laughs> brown rice. Anyway, at the lunch, he said to me, um, uh, now that I was at the BBC, um, I, I had a duty. I mean, he always thought in terms of duty and uh, what are you doing that's useful. Mm. And um, my duty was that he, he said there are all kinds of musicians, uh, instrumentalists or groups even, who either will not appear on the BBC or have never been asked to appear on the BBC because of the standard of popular music on the BBC. It's crap. If I say Cliff Richard, I'm not against Cliff Richard, mm. trust me. But I mean, that was how the mm -hmm. BBC pop music was. Yeah. And of course, this list included, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Cream and Donovan and the Beatles themselves, of course, um, and The Who and Pink Floyd. And I said, well, I don't know any of these. O oddly enough, I did know Pink Floyd because I was at school with Roger Waters. Yeah. Um, I mean, he was a few years behind me, but we, we both knew that we'd been to the same school. Uh, and um, so John said, you know, I'll... I'll get the people, you film them. Wow. So we did. Uh, and we made then in its day of absolutely notorious, it's still notorious film called All My Loving. That was the first, first blow. Not All You Need Is Love, All My Loving. Um, it's always called The Burning Monk Show. Yeah. One of the things that we were determined to do was to show the political background. It was, of course, the time of the Vietnam War and so on and so on. Um, uh, the political, uh, I was dead certain that I had, but this is what they wanted, to show the political background within which they were flourishing, um, but trying to say something. And um, it's an extremely provocative, even, even violent film. Which the it is. Yeah. And they wouldn't put on for months and months and months and months. Um, the reason that they did eventually is that's a separate story. but. Um, about so, a month before it was broadcast, I had a screening for John, and he came, and he didn't say much, but at the end he said, how do you think people are going to react to it? So I said, well, judging from the BBC, rather violent. He said, no, no, and I'm the newspapers, the critics. And I said, well, I think, you know, the red tops, the cheap newspapers, they'll love it because, you know, finally here is Jimi Hendrix on television, finally here's The Who on television, and so on and so on. And the serious newspapers of Times, Times Guardian as it was then, that sort of from the Telegraph, they'll think this is just a pretentious load of old tosh. Uh, and because um, of what throws everybody, even when they watch the film, is it actually begins uh, with Vaughan Williams, Vaughan Williams' Ninth Symphony. It actually begins, yeah. that's how it yeah. ends with Vaughan Williams' Fifth Symphony. And it goes via Vaughan Williams and, and Bartok and God knows who else. Right. En route, <laughs> mm -hmm. which, uh, anyway, um, so that was it. And then I said, he said, I'll, I'm going to bet you a fiver. Bastard never paid. Um, but, I mean, he never paid me, although he should have done. But in fact, he said it'll be the other way around. And he was absolutely right. The Red Tops hated the film. They thought this was pretentious garbage. Um, and they Tony, said, Tony, what, what do you mean by Red Tops? Oh, the sort of... Uh, the, Sun newspaper, the Daily Mirror, the Daily Oh, Mirror. okay. All right. And then the well, other established newspapers are what well, the no, Independent and the Guardian. I, mean, and... Uh, I suppose in America the equivalent is New York Post. Okay, right. Or, or gotcha. the Trump Post. Right, Anything right. To do with Donald Trump is I red. understand. See what I mean. A tabloid in a way. A tabloid, tabloid right. paper. Yeah. Exactly. But John said, no, no, it's going to be the other way around. He was absolutely right. The, the tabloid papers, they hated every note of it. Um, 
uh, because of what it was trying to say. And it, mm. it wasn't trying to say anything that the groups themselves or the artists themselves had not, and McCartney in particular is incredibly articulate um, about, you know, when, when you get the power, he said, you've got to use it for the good. Yeah. Uh, he always says, um, or as he said then. Uh, but the serious newspapers wrote acres upon acres upon acres about the film. I have no idea what most of it was about. But they did. <laughs> and every time it was repeated, yet another full page of, of interpretation of this complex film. Um, eventually it was called a masterpiece. I'm not sure it is, but this complex film was, well, uh, was uh, articulated. So, so, it, so All My Loving is, is an actual film. But then there's a series, right? Yeah, because then then what happened? I mean, that really cemented our relationship with John, uh, my relationship with John. There's an interesting story about All My Loving, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, go ahead. Uh, if you want. Yeah. Um, about uh, three or four years later, um, uh, I would love to say I was walking up Fifth Avenue uh, and John was walking down Fifth Avenue. I, I don't now remember exactly which avenue it was. In Manhattan, but we were definitely we crossed quite by chance in the street, and again we both stopped and had the giggles again. And he said lunch, and I said fine. Off we goes, all brown rice now in Manhattan, Manhattan <laughs> version of brown rice. <laughs> and during the course of the lunch, he said very, uh, he said very wise and interesting thing. He said many wise and interesting things, but in relation, uh, it, it, its opening line always. Uh, to many people, not just to me, was what are you doing that's useful? You know, in other words, what's your duty? You know, you've got a duty. Um, hence, all my loving was to smash down the, the walls of the BBC's Yeah, here we go. Thank you. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Right, away we go again. <laughs> okay, so you are having dinner with we're, we're having brown rice, right? We're brown rice, and he he made the point that uh, at that time, the sort of the end of the sixties, beginning of the seventies, it was fashionable in television to have these big thirteen-part, you know, history of America, Kenneth Clark's civilization, the ascent of man, Jacob Bronowski, these great yeah. sort of art uh, thirteen-part series. And John said, you know, one of the most, he felt, one of the most important cultural influences of the 20th century was the history of American popular music. And nobody had a clue about really what its origins were and where it came from and so on and so on and so on. So we made, are you getting this? It Fred? says it's recording, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so we made a list. You know, what is ragtime? Where does ragtime come from? Who were the great participants of it? What really is jazz? And so on and so on and so on. I made a list, I think, of 20 subjects eventually. And um, then having made the list, uh, I mean, I could see the, the, the wisdom of this idea. Nobody had ever attempted to do this, mm -hmm. to show how all the different strands were in fact related, but that had different origins and different purposes. The central purpose of all of them, of course, had to do with expressing the world in which these people lived, as in the political background. I mean, it was manna from heaven as far as I was concerned. Anyway, uh, having made the list, he then had to go and he, he got to the door and he looked back in this tiny little restaurant in Manhattan. And he said, I've got the perfect title for it. And I said, what's that? He said, call it All You Need Is Love. And then I said, well, hang on. There's some group that I vaguely remember wrote some song that has that title he laughed and just left anyway he subsequently wrote a little note saying i give you permission to use the title all you need is love but what was interesting was that when finally um it, the box set came out i mean not for uh, god knows how many years well it, it came out i think in 2004 eventually because we had a lot of problems with all i mean there was there's over 400 different music tracks in the whole series. And yeah. we had to somehow get the clearance for this. But we got them. And there it is in this beautiful box set. As in box set. 
Wow, I didn't know that existed. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know whether you can see it clearly. Can I can, you? yeah. Boxes. Nice. Yep. And all 17 hours are in there. Wow. Uh, anyway, when, when it came out, finally, um, the American distributor said, we've got to have clearance of the title. So I said, now, come on, you know, by now, 2004, this, all you need is love. Love is all you need. It's common parlance. You know? Yeah. No, no, no. I've got to have clearance. Which we then did. We got English copyright lawyer to check it all out. We found some wonderful things. Firstly, the Beatles themselves had never copyrighted the title. They'd never trademarked it even. So anybody could use it theoretically. But two people had copyrighted the title. Uh, one was a brothel in Amsterdam. <laughs> and the other was a maker of risque lingerie uh, in Hong Kong. <laughs> and I told that, John by now sadly was dead, but I told that to McCartney. McCartney thought it was the funniest that he'd ever heard. That, you know, one of his, one of their great songs <laughs> was now owned by a maker of Lis risque <laughs> lingerie in Hong Kong. Anyway, so I mean, essentially, all you need is love was, was not, not the making of it, but it was John's idea. Um, huh. And... Uh, all credit to him um, and he luckily he loved it he, he thought it was uh, he, I mean, he thought it was amazing that we'd managed to bring all these different elements together but, but I mean as I said I mean at that point when we did it 1975-76 nobody had even begun to attempt it yeah. I mean Ken Burns has ripped me off ever since but um, but nobody's, nobody actually sort of tried to take a general view just going back to All, All You Need Is Love, uh, All My Loving, the earlier film, which is 1968, there is an interesting footnote, I think, to it. Um, now, the first film I made, which we've talked about, the Benjamin Britten film, uh, I had an editor, film editor. But I, of course, was all, being me, I was always interfering, saying, you know, do this, cut here, do that. No, 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 all that sort of stuff, you see. The second film was All My Loving, and he said, the editor said, um, this time you do it. You do the cutting and I'll be there to help you so you don't make a complete mess of it. But, you know, you do it. So we agreed. Now, jumping many, many years forward, if you take a film um, that I made, I don't know which one, but, but fun enough, because I went to a big screening of it, last big charity screening of it a couple of weeks ago, big film about Henry Purcell which right. is two hours and 35 minutes long. Well, I edited that myself, um, in, uh, including all the music, at the absolute outside three weeks, probably less. Um, so I'm a, because I'm, I'm a better editor than director. I mean, I'm a really? very, very fast editor. Yeah, you're a very good editor too. That's something I really noticed. And I well, anyway, go, now go back, go back to all my life. So after six weeks of slaving with wonderful we knew we had wonderful material with Hendrix and so on and so on I was making a total shambles of it so the editor said to me um what we should do is we should take a week off um and then come back to it fresh so this was May 1968 and that we made that decision in the morning in the afternoon I went to what was then called uh, the Cinerama Cinema now called the Prince Edward Theatre, and they were showing a new film called 2001. Mm -hmm. So I went the following morning and afternoon and evening, and the following morning, afternoon and evening, I saw it about 15 or 16 times. That week alone, I could tell you every single frame of it. And of course, the irony is that many, many, many years later, I, I became, if not a close friend, certainly a a friend of Stanley Kubrick's, but yeah. I mean, that's way, way back. Now, of course, the thing that hit me forcibly was, apart from it being a work of genius uh, on, on more or less every level you care to think of, but what struck me very forcibly is that for 35 minutes, nobody says a word, but you don't get lost, even in the big mm -hmm. sequence at the beginning with the apes, you don't get lost, you know what you're being told, you know what the story is, and the, uh, the narration, as it were, the narrative, of, of entirely depends on the use of music, the use of images, and the combination thereof. Mm -hmm. Boy, did that hit me. 
So that's I something that I that's something that I noticed about the uh, about all you need is love is that um, there's no narration. No, there's no narration. But you that. you definitely tell a story just through the editing. Yeah. Of the of the well, film. Going back to all my loving, I then went back after our week's uh, rest, and all my loving as exists now. I mean, it's I think fifty four minutes. We edit. I edited it in a week because it was just now so clear that you could tell a story. Mm -hmm. It would be absolutely clear just by using music and images. There's a yeah. little bit of narration in All My Loving. I hadn't quite got to the point of jet jettisoning it all together. But I did after that. I realised you didn't need it. And of course, I told Kubrick the story many years later. And he told me, which I had not known, um, that in the original version of 2001, there was narration all the way through the ape sequence. Really? But at the last minute, Stanley decided that he could tell the story through words and pictures. He didn't need the narration. So they fired the poor actor they hired to do the narration. And then they suddenly realized they still didn't have anybody to voice Hal, the computer. So they said, you'll do, will you? <laughs> so the guy who voices Hal. Now, I don't think the story is generally known. The guy who voices Hal had been hired originally to do a narration in part one. Huh. what goes around comes around yeah so the 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 footage that you used in all my loving was that um mostly stock footage from the bbc or was it all footage that you had filmed yourself uh, or all the groups all the groups we filmed you filmed yeah, oh, yeah. i mean the, the stuff from vietnam that was archived right right yeah. um, and the burning the famous burning monks that was archive footage but no the groups themselves we filmed entirely ourselves every single group yeah. as we did in or, uh, as we did in um, uh, all you need is love i mean what is clearly an archive film in an old performance by bessie smith or whoever right clearly i didn't film since she was long gone by the time i arrived but practically i would say uh, at the archive apart we filmed a lot wow so when you're filming those episodes of All You Need Is Love, or did you actually go to Africa for the, those first Oh, yes, episodes? absolutely. Really? Wow. Absolutely. absolutely. And, I mean, we've got a map um, which was in the big box set that was not this box set, but there's another huge sort of uh, um, uh, presentation box set. I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's gigantic. Yeah. Um, in there, we've reproduced my 1975 diary. So you can see what I was doing on any given day. Hang wow. on. <laughs> so I don't know whether you can see it. That's that's my the facsimile of my 1975 diary. <laughs> so you open any page, quite arbitrarily. And I'm now looking at um, June the 30th. Uh, we start off with um, Joe Papp, Nash, uh, the, the New York City Theatre, Tom O'Horgan, Nesvi Ertigan, Lionel Hampton. The following day, July the 1st, Billy Hammerstein, who was Oscar's son, uh, nephew, sorry, followed by Richard Rogers, followed by Leroy Jones, followed by Benny Goodman, followed by George McRae. Wow. On the second... Of July, Clive Davis, Myra Friedman, Irving Caesar, one of my favorites, Stanley Adams, following yeah. Mary the K, and, and then in the evening, Carl Perkins. Yeah, I enjoyed yeah. the Irving the Irving Caesar interviews. Oh, <laughs> Irving Caesar, sorry. <laughs> Love him. Loved him. Loved him. So you would go to a location like, say, New York, and you would do the interviews for the entire series. Like, well, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, one thing that I'd realized was that we were never going to get all of the people that we wanted into a studio. Yeah. So the trick was always to go where they were. Mm -hmm. So we'd find out, I mean, with Bing Crosby to take an obvious case. I mean, I knew that Bing Crosby lived just outside San Francisco. So we, we got hold of, I think I actually got hold of him. Um, and I said, you know, if we come up to San Francisco, could we film it? Oh, yeah, sure, come on. <laughs> they like that. But if I had said to um, Bing Crosby, can you report to a studio in Los Angeles on Sunday? Right. They wouldn't do that. Well, they yeah. would, but they'd want, you know, 
mishmash. And it makes it so much more interesting to film yeah. them in, in their Absolutely. houses too. Like Absolutely. when you were uh, interviewing Hoagie Carr, Michael, that was really oh yeah, a part <laughs> of the house. that was the it. Interview. House in Los Angeles, they all were. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And Yubi Blake, Yubi Blake. I mean, who was ninety? I think 96, 97, who in the in the um, ragtime episode, you know, talks yeah. about you know. Scott, Scott Joplin sat here and I sat here. Uh -huh. I'm talking to someone who actually played with Scott Joplin. Yeah. <laughs> if you that's, see what I mean. That's something that I don't think anybody else did. I think he was 90 years old when you were... Yeah, you know, or at least 90. At least yeah. 90. Yeah, at wow. least 90. Yeah. I, I've never seen a, 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 a documentary about ragtime and i've always been very interested in ragtime yeah. and the origins yeah. of jazz and what it actually was and uh yeah. yeah that's quite an accomplishment so so at the same time you're in america are you catching up with like the rolling stones touring oh the... yes i mean well, well the, the, the great i think so it's a story sequence where we're backstage with them and the, with um, graham and and yeah, well, Bill Graham, and it was, it actually, uh, that wasn't a Bill Graham gig, but I know what you mean. Sure. But um, um, Keith, <laughs> in one of his more coherent moments, sure. says, uh, with, um, uh, uh, Elton John appeared. We weren't expecting to see Elton John. And Mick got quite cross, because wherever the camera was, Elton made sure he was in front of the camera. And Mick was <laughs> uh, but... Keith, uh, in one of his, uh, as I said, rare articulate moments, said, as they're walking off back on onto the stage, says, let's exorcise this demon once and for all. And I thought, hmm, interesting remark that. <laughs> I, I, that's what they were talking about. Yeah. yeah. No, I saw that. I didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> his hat getting in the he way. has an umbrella. Yeah, yeah. that's funny. That's right. No, Mick had the umbrella. Mick had the umbrella. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was very funny. It and was then, quite an experience. I mean, I look back now. I'm geriatric and I'm given up completely. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, I can't believe that I actually did all of that, but I did. Yeah. I've got the diary to prove it. You see what I mean? Yeah. But always, yeah. always the emphasis. I mean, I realised very, very early on that you know that uh, uh, country music was always the perfect example uh, for me. Man sees pretty girl, has guitar, goes, oh, my love. Yeah. Fine. Uh, another man hears me singing, oh, I love you, and thinks, oh, that sounds rather good. Why don't we put that on the radio? Down to Nashville, onto the Grand Ole Opry. Now, some other guy hears, oh, that, that would make a good record. Let's yeah. get the record and let's make a recording of it, et etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So slowly, what became as some started as something very simple in the Ozark Mountains, which is where we did film Jimmy Driftwood and, and right. others, yeah. suddenly is a huge commercial enterprise. So that, uh, and therefore, the essence of that song is utterly destroyed. Um, and, you know, in, in uh, the whole of po po popular music, if I can call it that, you know, those who refused completely to get involved in that. Of which the great example, of course, is, is Bob Dylan. You know, uh, the only people who've gone on and on and on. Everybody's got sort of sucked. I mean, the Rolling Stones, who cares what they do now? Pink Floyd, who yeah. cares what they do now? Yeah. But Bob Dylan, you do care. Because hmm. he's still making that connection with, you know, I love you. Right. right. Yeah. I, I, MTV, I, I mean, I, I ran a campaign for a while against MTV. I just, I thought that was the end of civilization. I really did. Yeah. I just found out that uh, Robert Maxwell owned half of MTV when, <laughs> when they first started. <laughs> you mean Robert Murdoch or Robert Maxwell? Robert Maxwell. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But uh, yeah, did you, um, it seems like you made a change from documenting rock music to to concentrating on classical. Um... Well, not quite, because the first film was Benjamin Britten, don't forget. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. sure. And, okay. and um, one one of the reasons for doing All You Need Is Love, but it, was a, it was a really minor reason was that I I felt, you know, in the interim, I, you know, I made the film with Leonard Cohen, Bird in the Wild, Rory Gallagher, uh, tour of uh, Cream Farewell and so on. I couldn't get away from it. 
Sure. And I thought, well, if I do, all you need is love. If I really do sum it all up, I can draw a line in the sand. That's as far as I will go with popular <laughs> music. Now, please, can I get back to where I thought I was going, which is the classical music, which is more or less what happened. I never made um, another pop music film after uh, All You Need Is Love. There really wasn't any need to after that. I mean, it was all well, pretty stagnant. After my, my critics yeah. wouldn't agree with you, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, there wasn't any. Uh, well, there was, I had nothing else to say. Yeah, yeah. because my my point was re relating the social and, as you've observed many times, the social and political background to how these people flourished. And yeah. I mean, when you've got John Hammond Jr. Um, taking you to, you know, this is where I discovered Billy Holiday, and then talks about Billy Holiday, and then talks about um, the um, uh, the clubs in Harlem where you know the blacks could perform on the stage, but they couldn't go through the front door. Right. And and um, John Hammond at one point, I mean, I haven't seen this episode. Well, I haven't seen any of it for ages. But John Hammond, as I recall, says at one point, you know, we'll be paying for this that for decades to come, how right he was. Well, that I was going to bring up that the uh, the most poignant part of that series for me was the the sequence where you're talking to uh, Janis Joplin's biographer. Oh, right, yeah. And and she says the same she says the same thing about that '60s that late yeah. '60s era that we're going to be paying we're going to be paying for this for a long time. Um, and I thought the way that she talked about Janis Joplin was so so poignant, and about yeah. the the people around her and how cold they were actually at yeah. the same time that they're professing all this, uh, you know, love and and compassion. Yeah. You know, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, but I mean, I felt I had to get back to Tyson because uh, that's what I once I got the bug. That's what I felt I might have something interesting to say. Yeah. About the great performers um, and art, artists and soloists of our time. But they, I think they, they all follow the same pattern that I uh, latched onto in, in the popular music. I mean, the Maria Callas film, I mean, for take that as an example. Um, I was, I did, partly because we started making it with her when she was still alive. And I, I realized very quickly that, um, that what she was trying to tell me was that she she had had her entire musical career wrecked by a fatal love affair, hmm. and it had destroyed her. The relationship with Onassis uh, had, oh, just, yeah. had had completely uh, destroyed her. I mean, uh, an even more extraordinary case in a way was uh, that that you hear in her voice. I mean, it's a kind of broken voice. It, it's not the pure great soprano that you know it all works sometimes it works up there sometimes it works only, yeah. only down here but from that broken voice comes great artistry right yeah. uh, and as in in the film the almost the last big sequence is uh, maria uh, singing from tosca visi date visi d'amore all for art all for love and you realize that there's that's the, the essence of it um even more terrible examples when when I made the film again with, uh, but then eventually about uh, Margot Fontaine, and I kept right. thinking, how could it possibly be the case that the that the most famous ballet ballerina, uh, other than the Russians of our time, finished up in a mud hut in Panama with no running water, no telephone, living off cornflakes because she was penniless. I mean, eventually she died of cancer, but she was living off. How did that happen? What happened in her life to make that, to give us that end? You know, she should have gone out in a blaze of glory. She didn't. Yeah. Hmm. So, you know, those kind of stories um, are what gripped me. I mean, the, the, you know, the big film I made about, um, Shostakovich is almost the paradigm case. Yeah. That, that was a cinema film with Ben Kingsley, but as you right. know. Yeah, I watched yeah. that. I watched that film. Yeah. But, but again, I, I mean, the point that, I mean, you couldn't have a more, a more clear example of this is the social and political background within right. which this man somehow survived and right. went on and on and on. 
and he's he, he's blatantly being pressured by the politicians to change his music absolutely. right and to well i mean he thought he was going to be shot several <laughs> times <laughs> yeah it's a very clear case of political machinations in music yeah, absolutely right? yeah. but i think you'd find that element in practically every film about the classic the, the non-pop world i've made i mean i made a big film about athol fugard uh, the great South African playwright. Well, you can't, again, you can't find a more obvious case. Yeah. I mean, this was a, a guy, as you know, this white Afrikaner who during the apartheid regime constantly attacked the apartheid regime, became a great friend of Nelson Mandela. As a result of which he had his passport taken away, his plays were banned and so on and so on. Now the ANC come to power uh, with Nelson Mandela uh, and he realized that they're every bit as corrupt as the apartheid regime. So he's now attacking the ANC, who ban his plays, take away his passport, and so on. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a political activist. I would say that, uh, I mean, I agree with, um, I'm trying to remember who it was who said it now, uh, um, it's the, the Bre uh, John Adams librettist. Um, uh, shame on me, I can't remember her name. It'll come back to me in a minute. Who at one point says, all art is political. Right. Yeah, I think Jacques, no way around that. It is. Jacques Attali says says some of the same things. That yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. There's no yeah. way around. It. Right. Do you think that there's um? I mean, there's there's kind of naked political maneuvering, uh, supporting, uh, being forced to support the Soviet government, things like that. But do you think that there is more subtle social engineering done through music or you're talking about now or, or that i mean now because of the ukraine war i mean it's no i mean i mean like in the 60s um did did john lennon ever talk about um just more more subtle less political but more social engineering through music well i mean i don't think i mean <laughs> I hate to say this about him, but I don't think he was, uh, subtlety was not his strong point. Right. Okay. I mean, he goes <laughs> straight in and tell him. Yeah. You know, you could, you could say that give peace a chance, for example, is subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it isn't. You know, either give peace a chance or you don't. Right. You see what I mean? Whereas something like Imagine, um, which contrary to um, practically everybody else, I don't think is his greatest ever achievement. I don't think so either. Uh, but I mean, that's more subtle. But I think a more interesting song, uh, since we're speaking about John, is Working Class Hero. Yeah. And, and I was much involved in that because um, he, uh, um, I, I, he, he knew, I can't remember how he knew, I'm just trying to remember. But uh, he, he, he saw, well, he was in it. He, he saw a film I made. Uh, for uh, London Weekend Television called The Pursuit of Happiness, in which he's in it with Yoko talk, uh -huh. as are a lot of other extraordinary people. Um, and it was about the American dream, really, of, um, and it, it coincided, more or less coincided, with the opening of the Lincoln Center. And John, for some obscure reason, had seen this. And he said, well, you know, why don't you do a, a film that has the same subject matter, but is about a town in England, you know, rather than, oh, about Brit Britain. Mm -hmm. um, so that became uh, a film about Birmingham. And I showed him the film, about, which then was a pretty desolate place. I mean, it was pretty awful. Um, and uh, he saw it and he said, you know, I've just, I've finished a song which hasn't been released yet which I think would make a perfect soundtrack. If you'd like to use it, use it. I'll send you a copy. So he did. That was Working Class Era. That's which was then eventually um, uh, released, uh, as you know, in a, in a, um, I'm just looking for this, in, um, I can't remember which album it was on. Uh, rock and Roll. Uh, yeah, one of the, yes. Around there, yeah. Around uh, there, yeah, yeah. Tony, Tony, I have to go pick up my daughter from school now. Oh right. Oh well. Okay. Can, no, can we do this again? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Did I've you have a good time? We've got. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I I thank you so much. It's it's Not really a pleasure for me. Not at all. Well, just drop me a line. Um, okay. and I'll try and I'll try and be a bit more organized. Not okay. not go to 
evenings. I mean, I'm a big, I, I'm a big supporter of um, uh, Iran and, and all their problems. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and this was a gathering uh, of people who supported the Iran, the Iranian freedom movement. Basically. I see. I see. And they suddenly produced this Iranian band. Which was just making wonderful music. Yeah. After that, we've got train strikes going on at the moment. We've got every right. conceivable kind of strikes, yeah. and I just got stuck. <laughs> I have to ask you, Tony. Don't you don't you have people banging your door down to do interviews with you and and talk to you um, like like I am? Or um, yes, but the answer is usually no. Really? But I well, <laughs> I was I was intrigued by your name, <laughs> and also uh, you know. I read what you wrote to me, and I thought, hmm, well, that sounds rather more interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tony. Okay, well, I'll, I'll drop you a line, and we'll do this again, okay? Okay, yes, just... just Great. Um, well, it's about to be Christmas, as right. you know. Yes, it's my birthday, and then my daughter's birthday, and then Christmas in the same week, so that's... Right. Uh, well, I go down to Cornwall at Christmas time, where, okay. where the... Uh, only if the wind blows in a certain direction do we have an internet connection. <laughs> okay. So All leave right. it till after in sometime in January. After the holidays. Okay. After Thanks holidays. again, Tony. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Happy holidays.